Hello and welcome to the Gastric Health Show. My name is Dawn Boxall and I have been a registered dietitian for over 25 years with the majority of my whole career has been in bariatrics and outside of a couple of years in um, Reno where I worked at a dialysis center. But additionally, during that time, I also continued bariatric support groups. So I have pretty much continued my whole career having been involved in bariatrics in some way. So this is something that um, I have a lot of passion about and I have the privilege of working with tens of thousands of bariatric patients, you know, up until last year, I worked um, at a bariatric center, a very large bariatric center, and um, had literally 20, almost 23,000 patients that we um, had and um, counseled for a couple of decades. So I have learned a lot and um, I don't practice as I did when I you know, first became a bariatric dietitian. Um, that wasn't even a thing <laughs> back in the 90s to, to be a bariatric dietitian. Um, it was not a specialty and it was not something that I was trained in. It was something that um, you learned uh, kind of, you know, through the ropes by, you know, experiencing um, just lots of patient volume that you really learned and adapted and adjusted throughout the time. So this week we are jumping kind of back into insulin. And I want to, you know, I had recently covered this topic, um, uh, one aspect of it, and I really wanted to dive in a little bit deeper and um, just kind of explore this whole issue with insulin um, resistance and insulin sensitivity and the importance of it and why it matters when it comes to your weight. And this week's title is, is insulin resistance to blame for weight gain? So we'll kind of dig into this and, and kind of get a maybe a new perspective, hopefully not new. Um, I do think with the changes that people are experiencing in healthcare, I think there is more of an awareness around this. And I think that more physicians are, you know, willing to do some of this testing and evaluation. So we'll kind of dig into this and I will tell you, I'm, if you follow me long enough, you know that I'm all about optimizing and really supporting you at optimal levels, depending on, of course, you know, your genetics play in that role and just how you feel, just hearing how you feel, but translating that into how can I optimize how this person feels right now in the middle of it? Because if you know you need to exercise to get your blood sugar down and your insulin level better, um, but you have no energy and no motivation, then we need to explore how can we improve that? So optimizing that, how can we optimize your motivation and um, your energy so that you have the ability to build that into your daily routine? So again, I'll talk about optimal levels. I'll dig into um, you know, what's considered average and normal, um, but then dive into some of the optimal things. And then also talk about food, um, what types of foods and diets are seen to help improve insulin resistance and um, that can support a healthy body weight and prevent weight gain. So we'll dig into this and hopefully you'll um, maybe have some talking points with your physician or your bariatric team. Um, now, I will tell you, in my experience, this was uh, lacking in the bariatric lab draws. This was not something that was ever looked at. We were not routinely checking these levels um, of insulin. So... And we were not really responsible or not 
it was not something that we were going to check or draw the um, your hemoglobin A1C or you know that three month snapshot of what your blood sugar has been doing. So again, I think as you as you dig into you as a person and you work with practitioners like myself who can help you maybe dial this in a little bit better and know which way to take this. Um, you'll have some talking points with your physician and know where you need to go next. So let's get started. Is insulin resistance to blame for weight gain? Now, I'm sure many of you have felt this way um, currently or in the past where you just can't lose weight no matter what you do. And maybe you've noticed that you gain weight more easily. And even following like a healthy diet and regular exercise. So maybe you're making good food choices and you're moving your body, but yet you don't see that you're getting the results and you don't feel like um, you're able to maintain a normal weight like you used to be able to. So if so, you could be experiencing insulin resistance or fluctuations in your insulin, which results in chronically high insulin levels in the blood due to a decreased response to insulin. So we're going to discuss insulin resistance and how it contributes to weight gain and how it can be addressed. So what is insulin and how does it work? Insulin is a hormone that helps your body regulate blood sugar levels. And when your, when your blood sugar levels rise, so we eat food, and you're naturally, your blood sugars are supposed to increase. And then within an hour and a half, two hours, it should start coming back down. So those are normal reactions and not concerning. So everyone is going to experience that because that's how it's intended. But what happens is as that rises, and then an hour and a half, two hours later, it's supposed to be coming back down. When it's coming back down, it's because of insulin doing its job. And it's able to kind of, insulin, think of as a cruise ship director where insulin kind of says, hey, glucose, come over here. Um, I want you in this room. And then I want you in this room and you in that room. And putting it away into all of our cells and muscles and liver and storage places. So, or, you know, utilizing it for energy right then. So regardless, insulin has some important roles, but if your insulin is not responding or you are insulin resistant, then you won't be, your insulin levels or your blood sugar levels won't be coming back down. Um, after that rise, it will continue to stay elevated, which then leads to diabetes. So that's kind of the nutshell of how insulin is supposed to work. So what is insulin resistance? So insulin resistance is a condition where the body's cells become insensitive to insulin. So it's no longer going to respond as it should. So, and what happens is this leads to high insulin levels in the blood, and this can result in various metabolic abnormalities like impaired glucose tolerance, dyslipidemia, so think of um, your cholesterol, your LDL, HDL, um, all of those, um, lipid profiles, triglycerides, all of those um, are going to be affected also hypertension, and increased heart disease and diabetes risk. And several factors can contribute to insulin resistance, like your genetics, um, having obesity already. So if you've corrected that, that's great. You're likely in a better place. Um, but if you have you know, some of the genetics, it might make it more difficult because of your history. Um, also, physical inactivity, poor sleep, and certain medications can all factor into what that insulin level does. And additionally, processed carbohydrates, sugars, fats, um, they all impair insulin sensitivity and increase insulin resistance. So what are normal insulin levels? 
And normal insulin levels is essential to determine whether or not you have insulin resistance. So a person's insulin levels vary according to whether or not they have eaten recently. And uh, a fasting insulin level, so say you fasted overnight, went to your doctor, had a fasting insulin level. That is kind of um, the gold standard of evaluating your insulin and what it is doing. So a fasting, you would always want it to be a fasting level and are used, these fasting insulin levels are used to assess insulin resistance and sensitivity after an overnight fast. And according to the American Diabetes Association, normal fasting insulin levels are as follows. Adults should have less than 25 micro IUs per milliliter and children and adolescents should have less than 20 micro IUs per milliliter. So let's just think of the numbers. So you want it to be less than 25 for an adult, and then um, children and adolescents should be less than 20. So other sources, however, have recommended that your level should be below 10. And here's the thing. Having a fasting insulin level between 10 to 25 for some individuals may make weight gain super easy and weight loss difficult. And if you follow me long enough, you know that I'm all about optimization because again, the genetic piece. And I will say, uh, again and again that this is this is where I changed as a practitioner truly understanding the power of genetics and the interplay between all these different genes that are influencing your ability to maintain health, healthy levels so if I have someone I mean there are over 19 different genetic SNPs that influence your glucose and insulin regulation if you are an individual who has several of those and your insulin levels, your fasting insulin is elevated, your, your fasting blood glucose is elevated, your uh, hemoglobin A1C is elevated, your body is not responding well to how, you're, how you are um, eating, sleeping, moving your body and stress. And it could be driven because just from those different genetic patterns that you have, making it more difficult for you to actually easily attain normal levels. So this is where I want you to, you have to think out of the box because I will say counseling so many thousand, tens of thousands of people, you see that there's, no one formula that seems to work for everyone and especially when it comes to weight especially and this is where for me i feel like the personalization with the genetic test really just optimizes the ability to really translate it into actionable steps for you because as practitioners, your, your registered dietitian, your you know, primary care doctor, your bariatric surgeon, any ologist, if you, you know, see a gastroenterologist, a cardiologist, any of us would be utilizing, without genetics, you would be utilizing just broad, basic approaches. So you would be offering things that... Um, in research has been shown to be um, a good performer in results. So to me, this is where the genetics just shine and it allows you to, to really personalize and really hone in on what's gonna work best for you. Because maybe you can't maintain at a, a, insulin, a fasting insulin of 20 without having weight problems 
in diabetes where you need um, diabetic medication or you need um, blood pressure medication or you need, you know, you name it, any, um, you know, some type of heart medication. All of these things, um, to me, I, I, I look through the lens of prevention and protecting you from getting into those those arenas. So if we can if we can tweak back your insulin, your your fasting insulin to 10 or less and you don't need blood pressure meds and you don't need any diabetes medication. To me that's that is the optimal goal that we're trying to optimize your body with the least restrictive way. And um, so again, I think you have to think optimal t at times. And I think that's the missing piece because we didn't have the genetics um, to even reference to, you know, decades ago, but now we do. So the more that healthcare connects these dots and starts utilizing these um, genetic, this genetic information will make it so much easier on you as a person, as an individual, as a patient, because we're no longer just providing um, recommendations for mass populations. We are providing recommendations that is only for you, that may likely only work for you. So again, I think this is where you have to consider that there are people who will need more optimization of that um, fasting insulin level. And you can't follow the standard reference range without having problems with your blood sugar or your um, weight or your blood pressure or other health conditions. So what are some optimal insulin levels? Um, and to date, there is no scientific consensus on an optimal insulin level. But again, some believe that keeping it under 10 is going to be optimal. And to me, this is the genetic piece. And that's where if I have somebody, if they have the majority of these 19 genetic SNPs that the odds are stacked against them, that we're really going to struggle with maintaining um, a healthy insulin level, that we have to tweak things in a way that helps maximize um, as much as possible. Or it gives me information to know that, hey, if I get this person 225, this may be the best we're doing. And that's okay. And to not uh, be concerned about an insulin of 25 because um, it's a normal reference range. But again, I think it goes back to the individual and what's, what's occurring. <laughs> Are they having issues with their weight and their blood sugar and their blood pressure and their heart? Um, then we might have to push further. So that's, again, the genetic piece is, to me, the missing link that can really, really drive better results for anyone. For example, um, glucose and insulin balance begin at the genetic level and there are seven genetic glucose and insulin influencers. So you can have pancreatic dysfunction, pro-inflammatory fat and inflammation, glucose and triglyceride clearance from the blood, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, your muscle mass and your liver can all influence how well you're able to attain a healthy insulin level. So even to get to that 25 and under, um, or any to me, anywhere between that 10 to 25 is all going to be determined on the genetics that are at play with all of these factors. Your pancreas, inflammation, glucose and triglycerides, your history of obesity, or if you currently have obesity, your sedentary lifestyle, your muscle mass, and your liver, all of those are going to influence how well that plays out. And combinations of certain genes in each of these determine where your insulin may normally hang out, requiring kind of a different approach just to bring your blood glucose and insulin level to acceptable ranges that will prevent issues with weight gain. 
Additionally, we know a fasting insulin can detect early signs of insulin resistance. So regular monitoring is useful for catching dysregulation in your metabolic markers. So again, this is something that traditionally, this has not been a target lab for most healthcare um, centers or providers. Um, it's never been one that has been monitored. And that's where you have to kind of think, okay, well, how can I help myself? I can, I can advocate for just checking this level to see where I land because without checking, you really don't know. And um, it's good to at least annually know where your insulin is. And if it is elevated, say above 25, then having it checked regularly more than once a year um, is better so that you can work on changing that outcome. Um, there is some research that shows a fasting insulin greater than seven as being associated with a significant increase in future risk of metabolic syndrome and type two diabetes. So here we're even surpassing, you know, the, the 10 mark. So we're saying once you hit a seven on your fasting insulin, the research shows us that you significantly increase your risk of metabolic syndrome and type two diabetes. And I'm just gonna take this back to personal uh, for myself with doing um, a CGM because this continuous glucose monitor for me, I was seeing the trends. Once I got out of denial, and if you've listened to other podcasts from me, I was in denial of this. Um, as this began, my fasting glucose began to be a problem in 2021 and continued to rise and stay elevated um, to date. And so that is when I, even though now my A1C is not elevated in prediabetes range and my um, insulin is not elevated above the seven, but they were trending up. So I have these genetic SNPs that regulate insulin and glucose. So I know that I have to stay on top of this. I know that this is an area that if I can keep in a safer range, the, the likelihood of me developing these um, are lower. So that is where the CGM came into play. So that gave me information and real time feedback, like immediate feedback of what is truly happening when sticking your finger or pricking your finger with a, a glucometer may have missed some of those. So I'm not opposed to any glucometer, not at all. But again, I think the continuous glucose monitor is sometimes um, better at detecting things with fluctuations. So if we know that an insulin above seven, a fasting insulin above seven, has an increased risk for future metabolic syndrome and type two diabetes, some people may have better outcomes by tightening up that reference range to having their fast, fasting insulin between two and five. So again, this is, this is personal. This is not blanket for everyone. This is not, um, necessary for everyone. And this is where working with practitioners like myself can be helpful to help optimize what you truly need. You know, dialing in the genetics and dialing in um, with a CGM on what's truly happening on a daily basis, even if you did it for a month, um, I think it would provide you feedback. You can check with your insurance. The Freestyle Libre is one that they offer a free 14 day trial. So if you're curious and you're unsure, step one, I would say ask your doctor for your fasting insulin first, and then make sure you know where your fasting glucose and your A1C is. And if any of those are in prediabetes range, any of them, your fasting, your insulin, your A1C, if there are any of them in the prediabetes range, a Freestyle Libre might be a good idea for even two weeks to just evaluate and get feedback so that you can make better informed decisions with your 
food, your stress, your sleep, and your activity. That is, I would tell you, very... Um, those factors are going to influence those numbers. So um, making sure that you are, you know, working with someone during that time. And that's where if you're a gastric health member, um, working with this, um, a CGM, there's ways that we can do that together and work through that and see how well um, your body is performing. So Weight gain and insulin resistance. Um, high insulin levels, such as those associated with insulin resistance, so think of greater than 25. We're gonna keep it at just the normal. We're gonna talk about just the normal, not even just the optimal. Uh, but personally, I would say that anybody that's in between that 10 to 25 could fall in this category if you have the right genetics. Um, so high insulin levels, um, are, such as those associated with insulin resistance, signal the body to store glucose instead of burning fat for energy. This is because insulin promotes glycogen, which is your stored um, sugar, and um, promotes glycogen uptake and storage by cells, um, particularly fat cells, while inhibiting fat breakdown and to be used by your muscles and other tissues. So basically we're saying that um, insulin promotes storage of glucose and kind of locks them away so when you your body needs energy, it won't tap into those fat stores. So whenever those insulin, those fasting insulin levels are above 25, then you're going to be at risk for those fat cells kind of being locked away and not being burned as fuel. So this is where weight gain is compounded further. So you're going to struggle more with um, gaining weight with a high insulin level. And you're going to be weight loss resistant when those insulin levels are elevated. Additionally, high insulin levels can promote fat storage and insulin resistance as they make cells desensitized to insulin over time. In response to the reduced response of the cells, the body produces even more insulin, resulting in even higher insulin levels and worsened insulin resistance. So because we're not able because your blood sugar is continuing to remain high because that insulin is not able or not capable of of doing anything about that elevated blood blood sugar then your body produces more insulin to help again try to lower that so high insulin levels can contribute to weight gain by increasing hunger and cravings for you know those carb carby type foods those carb rich foods um, and this is because insulin stimulates the production of the neurotransmitters that regulate your appetite and mood. Now, what are the studies linked to insulin resistance and weight gain say? There have been several studies showing that insulin promotes fat storage. So we know that this is an issue. This is, this is the action that occurs with um, high levels of insulin. Glucose is stored and fat storage kind of increases. And the Journal of Obesity published a study in which healthy volunteers burn less fat and more carbohydrates as energy when their insulin levels were elevated, indicating the body preferred glucose over fat as a fuel source. Another study found that high insulin levels reduced fat availability for energy by inhibiting the release of fatty acids from the fat cells. So kind of like what we were saying earlier, it the blood sugar, those blood glucose gets stored in the fat and it locks them away to not be used as energy. So maintaining normal insulin levels is crucial to promoting fat metabolism and preventing fat storage. So if you truly want to lose your fat mass and not muscle, not just weight, um, but actual fat mass, you have to look at insulin levels. You have to know where you fall on that to know if this is a contributor. And once you have that ruled out, you know where to go next. So what about diet and insulin resistance? So there is there a specific diet one should follow with insulin resistance? 
um, or to prevent it from occurring. And again, to me, this is very individual, as some may require um, a tight, regulated, low-carb diet, where others will benefit from including more carbohydrates, and maybe more specific carbohydrates, I should say. Um, and this is why personalization is beneficial and why I find the genetic test to be so helpful. Because just saying everyone with insulin resistance or everyone with a high insulin level should follow a very low carb or ketogenic diet is unnecessary and kind of misleading. So I think I would say, however, that most practitioners would agree that to improve insulin levels will require consuming fewer carbs. I think it's, it's crucial to kind of understand that it doesn't mean no carbs or mean you have to be on a keto diet. So this is where you have to work with a practitioner that can truly help dial this in for you. There are studies that show there are foods that can play a big role in preventing and resolving insulin resistance. And I will tell you, some of these you may be surprised with, because um, one is plant-based foods. And one study suggested that a diet high in protein without adequate plant-based foods may contribute to insulin resistance. Although this is an animal study, the research found that the mice fed a 90% animal protein and 10% uh, plant protein diet had higher insulin resistance than the mice fed a 50% animal protein and 50% plant protein diet. To me, this would also, I would want to factor in the genetic piece to understand um, more personally what um, we would see with certain genetic SNPs. But according to this study, the insulin resistance may be associated with excess animal protein intake without adequate intake of plant-based foods. Um, the study highlighted the importance of a balanced diet with plant-based nutrition to prevent insulin resistance. So again, I think you have to dial this in personally because I know of people who this would totally not work with. And we would have to be very careful on the, the specific plants they used and before that would actually work well for them. So let's kind of have a conversation about the bariatric high protein, low carb diet most follow. Although I do believe many will have better success following this style of eating, I don't think that it has to be a very low carb diet. So um, 20 to 50 grams of carbs that most patients need to follow. Um, bariatric patients are at risk for insulin resistance due to their higher risk of obesity and related conditions. But after bariatric surgery, many patients prioritize protein intake and do not consume enough plant-based foods. Um, in fact, many are notorious for filling up on a lot of meat and cheese and then having no space for any types of plants or carbs. Um, or I should say, maybe plants, um, but they seem to find space for, um, usually because of the ease of, or maybe the ease of digesting and consuming, but also the convenience of the protein shakes and bars and, and protein chips that are out there. But unfortunately, all of those are lacking in fiber and other nutrients. So, um, but yet they are helping you hit your protein goal, which has been um, beaten into you as a bariatric patient that this is the most important thing to consider. And although I agree we need to prioritize protein, I disagree that we have the same percentages for every person. And I think this is where personalization would help. And allow you more food freedom and allow you to have a better relationship with food because you're not going to be so restrictive in certain areas. So again, I think it is um, something that you have to consider. As a bariatric patient, you have to evaluate and ask yourself, 
how many types of plants do I consume in a day? So this is one study. This is one um, example. So by no means is this the end all be all. Um, but there is another study, the Mediterranean diet, um, the Mediterranean or low carb diet. These were evaluated as well in research and the Mediterranean and low carb diets are effective in reversing insulin resistance in several studies. So um, I do continually find, which I would say to date really the Mediterranean diet has been the only diet that um, some health professionals and researchers and scientists have found um, to be applicable to mass populations. Um, so I'm not surprised by this. So um, a study found that a Mediterranean diet low in carbs and high in fat improved insulin sensitivity and reduced in inflammation markers in obese adults. And you have to remember that you can't just hone in on the low in carbs and high in fat because a Mediterranean diet is very specific in certain foods. So it is not just about being low in carbs and high in fat, it is about what is composed um, in those carbs and fats. Where are they coming from? So similarly, another study published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism found that people with type 2 diabetes who ate a low-carb diet and impro had improved insulin sensitivity and glucose control. Diets containing 14% carbs, 28% protein, and 58% fat led to significant improvements in hemoglobin A1C levels, a long-term blood sugar marker, which you are aware of. Um, the researchers suggest that switching to a low carb or Mediterranean diet may benefit people with insulin resistance. Again, more evidence for personalization. However, dietary requirements vary from person to person. So before making any you know, changes, just because you listen to this podcast or watch this YouTube video, please consult a healthcare professional like myself for guidance. The next ones are um, prebiotics and fiber. So studies have shown that consuming prebiotic fibers, so of course these are going to be coming from plants, um, and overall fiber, and, and when you include it with probiotics, can reduce insulin resistance. Prebiotic fiber is um, just non-digestible fibers that help promote the growth of beneficial gut bacteria. So think of prebiotics as the food for your probiotics. So taking probiotics for most people, not 100% of you, if you have digestive issues, um, you may not tolerate prebiotics. Um, especially if you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, this would be contraindicated in loading up on a bunch of prebiotic fibers. Um, so several prebiotic fibers have been found to reduce insulin resistance and improve insulin sensitivity, including inulin and fructooligosaccharides. Um, further studies have shown that adequate fiber intake helps control blood sugar levels uh, and insulin sen sensitivity. Evidence shows that high, higher fiber intake reduces the risk of type 2 diabetes and improves glycemic control. And additionally, probiotics, which are live bacteria that confer health benefits, have been linked to improve insulin sensitivity and glucose metabolism. Therefore, consuming foods rich in prebiotic fibers and then just fiber in general and probiotics can support metabolic health and reduce insulin resistance. Awesome. So to me, those are just no-brainers, and I would say our ultimate gut restore is probably, uh, not probably, it is our, our best probiotic that and most popular probiotic that does just this. It, it has a very um, easily digestible prebiotic fiber included in it, but I also include, I encourage you to consume prebiotic fibrous foods when you take a probiotic like our Ultimate Gut Restore. So if you um, haven't checked that out, I would encourage you to check it out. It, again, is a great um, probiotic to consider. The next is uric acid and insulin resistance. Um, a study suggests that uric acid may contribute to insulin resistance as well. The kidneys normally excrete uric acid. 
but inflammation and insulin resistant can result um, if levels are high. So if your uric acid level is elevated, then you will likely have issues with inflammation and insulin resistance. So again, this is a good marker that your physician can easily check. Just check those uric acid levels and make sure they're in normal reference ranges. Um, if you're if your uric acid levels are elevated, avoiding foods high in purine and limiting alcohol consumption can help you reduce uric acid levels. Um, some lifestyle factors and insulin resistance. So lifestyle factors like poor sleep, lack of exercise, and additionally kind of like season of life things like menopause can also contribute to insulin resistance and weight gain. And here's a review kind of of each of these factors. So poor sleep. Studies have shown that people with poor sleep have increased insulin resistance, glucose intolerance, and increased risk for type 2 diabetes. And then additionally, research suggests that short sleep duration, poor sleep quality, and sleep disordered breathing affect glucose metabolism and hormone regulation contributing to insulin resistance. This is a really big one, and this is something that you cannot ignore. If you have elevated fasting insulin, you have to monitor your sleep and work on it, work on improving it. Um, and if you have sleep disordered, you know, breathing where maybe you need a CPAP or BiPAP machine, again, dial this in, work with your provider on making sure the settings are correct because this is an important piece in having healthy insulin and blood glucose numbers. The next is exercise. And this is probably at no surprise to you that exercise and physical activity have a number of health benefits including improved insulin sensitivity, lower blood glucose levels, and improved metabolic health. Exercise increases the glucose transporter type 4 or the GLUT4 expression in your muscles, which also increases insulin sensitivity. So again, the more you are moving your body and using your muscles and prioritizing your muscles will improve insulin signaling and make you more insulin sensitive, which is good. You want to be more insulin sensitive. Um, the next is time-restricted feeding, um, or as most know it as intermittent fasting. And it has become very popular for improving insulin resistance and metabolic health. And studies have shown that time-restricted feeding can help reduce inflammation, increase insulin sensitivity, and promote weight loss, especially when combined with an exercise program that promotes weight loss. So not the end all be all. I, again, I am neutral on these types of approaches with intermittent fasting, ketogenic diets, um, just the numerous things out there. To me, I want you to be the least restrictive as possible and um, it needs to be sustainable. So to me, this is where I need genetics before I really want to tap into a bunch of fasting without understanding how your body's going to respond and if we could do this without having to restrict. So again, restricting is, um, again, time-restricted feedings or intermittent fasting, I'm not against. I think it's just um, an approach that can work for some but not work for everyone. Um, the last one is menopause. And menopause is just kind of that change in a female's life with hormones that actually increase insulin resistance and the risk of metabolic disorders like type 2 diabetes. So as you transition into menopause, you truly increase your risks for diabetes and insulin resistance. And I personally have experienced this and understand this um, firsthand that genetically I was predispositioned for this and I did not have the genetics kind of, um, or I got it right after, I think, before it, I started transitioning. Um, and 
had I had applied some of these things sooner, I think some of my um, experience would have been way different. So, but in menopause, women should maintain a healthy weight, exercise regularly, and eat fiber-rich and plant-based foods. And the last one is menopause. And menopause is um, really that transition of hormones in a female's life that um, no one is avoiding. There's no way out of this. We, you have to go through this. And the unfortunate thing is, is this is where you become more insulin resistant and you become a higher risk for type 2 diabetes. So this is where, you know, you have to dial this in. And I can say from firsthand experience that, you know, understanding my genetics and knowing that that can kind of turn that on and, and knowing that I had that um, genetic connection, that this piece could be a problem. And with seeing my pre-diabetes fasting glucose becoming a problem and consistent and not changing, um, I knew that I had to make changes and I knew I needed to approach my diet and my lifestyle differently than I had the majority of my life. Um, and that was okay. Once I, you know, got out of denial and got to the point where I was prepared and ready to do something about it, because, you know, let's face it, not always do we want to do something about it. And to me, there's nothing wrong with that. But we know that menopause creates this. So perimenopause is where it all begins. And then um, menopause is where it continues and where you will likely land with insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes if you do nothing about it. So if you um, aren't proactive and in a preventive mindset, you are likely going to struggle with that once you get into menopause or even maybe it might begin in perimenopause for some people. So again, you have to look at how can I approach menopause and how can I protect myself from this natural occurring um, phenomenon that occurs with menopause of becoming insulin resistant, what can I do? And that's where, you know, maintaining a healthy weight, exercising regularly, eating fiber rich and plant-based foods can all play a great role in preventing complications from this occurring. So let's wrap this up. A person with insulin resistance may gain weight and have difficulty losing weight. Therefore, preventing and resolving insulin resistance can aid in improving insulin sensitivity while achieving a healthy weight. And you can control insulin resistance and lose weight by eating a balanced diet, consuming adequate fiber, reducing uric acid levels, and maintaining just a healthy overall lifestyle. So we've covered a lot and I hope it makes sense. I hope you um, have a better understanding and maybe some talking points to your doctor on what can I do? How can I do something about where my fasting insulin is? First, get it checked. Second, make sure it's under 25. Then evaluate, okay, am I having trouble with um, cravings? Am I having problems with weight gain? Am I having um, elevated blood, fasting blood glucose and hemoglobin A1C? Am I having blood pressure issues or am I needing diabetic medications or um, maybe heart, some heart issues? Am I having, am I, are some red flags showing up in my health? If you can answer yes to that, get that insulin level checked and then you know Okay, if I need this, in, if I'm above 25, first let's get it between 10 and 25. Reevaluate. Do I need to go lower? Am I better if I'm at a 20? Am I better if I'm at a 15? Where is the sweet spot for myself so that I prevent disease states and put myself in a position where I can manage my health? without needing a ton of medications to make that happen. So once you know that, I mean, you, you have the information you need to move forward and make changes. So again, check out our Gastric Health membership. This is the place where you can 
get the insight and the resources you need to stay informed, make changes, and um, grow the confidence you need to, you know, do the things you want to do in life by just correcting and improving some of the, the levels that you currently experience. So I hope this has helped. You guys have a great week and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.